as I shared earlier, we are in a series where we're looking at major wars in the Bible. And on Wednesday night, we will talk about Nebuchadnezzar, the great war where the children of Israel were defeated because of their unfaithfulness to God. And it's a stark warning to the church today of how important it is that we remain faithful to God. Otherwise, we will be defeated. The Bible says, because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's a prophecy that we don't talk about. But we believe that we will be on fire for the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so we don't, we're not afraid of that prophecy because we claim that that is not for us because we are faithful to God. And then we're going to end the series as we look at the Battle of Armageddon. As we prepare for this great battle that we see gearing up in the world in which we live, the times in which we live, we see, are beginning to see a great falling away taking place even among the people of God. As our churches become smaller and smaller, I am confident with this statement that none of our churches are, could boast that we are growing uh, coming out of COVID. We are all admitting that there is a great struggle as people walk away from the church. And so we need to ensure that our relationship is right with God so that we are not deceived by the devil into believing that there is something better on the other side. This is called the post-Christian generation because people are walking away from Christianity. And so if there were ever a time that we need to wake up and recognize the time in which we live, that time is now. Not only do we need to straighten up and, and fly right in terms of our, our Christian walk with God, but we need to share the gospel. Because part of the responsibility of the church is to tell the wor world, warn the world, that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And they need to come into the house of safety before it is eternally too late. Amen. But today we're going to look at Gideon and the 300, a very, very famous story found in the book of Judges chapter 6. Let us pray. <clears throat> Speak to our hearts now, we pray. Our hearts are opened. Our minds are ready to receive from you. We know your spirit is here. So bless, guide, reveal. And help us, Lord, to leave this place convinced that all we need is Jesus. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> if you were given the responsibility of finding, finding someone, a leader, a military leader, to lead God's army into battle, what kind of person would you choose? Would he have to be tall, strong, and handsome? Some people are shallow like that. Would he have to be fearless? A military expert with wartime experience. Would he have to have the ability to inspire men and women to take on the mission, even if it comes at the risk of their own lives? 
How confident would you be in him if he was scared? Had no military experience. Saw himself as the weakest of the weak in his community. Would you pick him? <laughs> and yet, whether we're talking about David, Josiah, Esther, or the 12 disciples, God has a way of proving us wrong by taking the nobodies like you and me, the one folks don't believe much in, and turning us into somebodies for the sake of his kingdom. For we see, he sees in us not who we are, but who we could become if we put our faith and trust in him. Well, when we meet Gideon in Judges chapter 6, he is threshing wheat on the floor of a wine press. Somebody asked me, what is he doing threshing wheat in a wine press? I'm glad you asked. You see, the reason Gideon is here threshing wheat in a wine press is because Gideon is afraid. And he's afraid because the Midianites have become a pain in the neck of the Israelites. The Midianites were like that big bad bully at school who every time you show up with your lunch, he would just come and take your lunch away from you. And that there was nothing they could do from stopping him. Do you all know those bullies? Or maybe you were the bully. <laughs> every time the Israelites planted their crops and, and, and they watered it and they, they watched it as it grew and it started bearing fruit, when it was time for harvest, the Midianites would come in and take their stuff. They would take all their produce. They would take all their animals. And there was nothing that the Israelites could do to stop them. Things got so bad that after a while, the Israelites decided, some of the Israelites decided that they would go and live in the mountains and the caves just to get away from the Midianites. They had become broke, busted, and disgusted. And this went on for seven years. They would plant, they would grow, they would watch their plant grow, and everything was ready for harvest. And as soon as it was time for harvest, here comes the Midianites and take all their crops. But after seven years of suffering, the people could take it no longer. And so they cried out to the Lord. Now I find this to be very interesting. You see, I can't help but wonder, why did it take them seven years? before they finally realized that they needed God's help. For seven years, they tried to solve their problems on their own. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> seven years, they tried to figure it out, they hide the crops and, 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 and fight the Midianites, run and fight. They, when it didn't work, they went up into the caves, but, but now they were hungry and they were broke and sick. Seven years, they try to do it all on their own. I imagine that when everything failed, that they finally figured out, we better call on God. How long does it take for you to realize that you can't do it in your own strength. The issues you're facing with your family, you can't solve it on your own. 
the financial challenge that you're dealing with, you can't solve it on your own. Even that sin problem that you're struggling with, you cannot solve it on your own. The health issue that you're battling, you cannot solve it on your own. When will we finally realize that God is not just an option, but he is the first, the last, and the best choice that we can make? So when everything else failed, finally they decided we better call on the Lord. And God sent an unnamed prophet to point out to them why this was happening. As their God, God promised and gave to them a land flowing with milk and honey. But before giving them this land, God drove out all of their enemies. Go back and read uh, about the walls of Jericho and, and all the different battles that God himself drove out all their enemies. And God didn't just give them any land. He gave them the best land. That's why the Bible called it a land flowing with milk and honey. There was no land like this land. God had been faithful to them, and one thing God required from them, and that was that they worshipped God and Him only, and yet they were unfaithful to God. And so the reason they found themselves in this struggle against the Midianites was not because of the Midianites. It was all because they had chosen to be unfaithful to God. Well, finally, they cry out to God, and God agrees to deliver them. And so God looks and finds this man, Gideon, threshing wheat in the wine press. He is in the wine press threshing wheat because he's afraid of the Midianites. The idea of threshing wheat in a wine press is laughable. You see, the way you thresh wheat, they tell me, is that for this to be effective, you have to be out, outdoors, in an open field, maybe in a high place, so that the wind could blow and separate the, char the chaff from the wheat. So here he is in a, in a hole somewhere struggling, trying to do something that is not possible. But Gideon didn't want to be seen by the Midianites. He was hiding. He was afraid. And so he's trying to do this thing that is not really working. And so as he hides in the wine press, the angel of the Lord approaches him and greets him with a saying, Oh, mighty man of valor. Now, the original Hebrew translation says, that the way the angel actually greeted uh, Gideon was saying, mighty, mighty man of valor. And Gideon looks around like, you don't know me? <laughs> He's looking to see who the angel is talking to because he knows he is anything but a mighty man. It's kind of, it kind of sounds sarcastic because how could God call Gideon a mighty man when he finds him hiding from the Midianites. And so the question is, was the angel being truthful? Or was he just patronizing Gideon? It's critical that we understand that God looks at every man and every woman and sees the best in us. In fact, sometimes God sees what you and I can't see in ourselves. Not just who we are, but all that we could become if we put our faith and trust in him. He looks at Gideon and he sees in him uh, not a present, but a future man of valor. The question is, do you believe that all things are possible with God. Amen. Do you believe that God can do great and mighty things through you? 
no matter how weak or feeble you may feel. Do you believe in the power of God? Do you believe that God can use this church to do great and mighty things if we would but just put our faith and trust in him? Now the angel then says to Gideon, the Lord is with you. And Gideon says, oh, really? Well, if the Lord is with us, then why has all these things happened to us? If the Lord is with us, where are the miracles which our fathers told us about? about? When they said, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? And now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And like Gideon, many ask the same question. You say we have the truth. You say that we are God's remnant people. You say that we are spiritual Israel. Then if the Lord is with us, why, are, why am I battling cancer? If the Lord is with us, why are my children in a distant country of sin? If the Lord is with us, why is the church so weak and feeble today? Where is the Lord that did all the miracles and the wonderful things in the past? Why is he not present today? If the Lord is with us, why are our prayers not being answered? And the angel said, it's funny you said that. Because Israel has found itself in this situation because of one reason and one reason alone. And that is, instead of worshiping the God of heaven and earth, Jehovah Jireh, who brought you out of Egypt and watched over you and provided for your every needs, need all along the way, you have turned to worship the Baals instead. And maybe, just maybe, we are struggling with the issues of life because we have forsaken the God that we say we believe in. Oh, we may not have totally walked away from him, but some of us are halfway in the church and halfway outside. We try to hold on to the world and the church at the same time because we don't quite believe in the God we claim we believe in. Well, the angel came to help Gideon develop some faith in God and to let him know that in spite of all of the things that they were suffering from, that, that, that help was on the way. Yes, God was about to use Gideon to deliver his people. You know the story. A few famous convincing God took with the, 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 the fleece and the, and the dew. And, and, and after God showed Gideon that he was all-powerful, Gideon began to trust in God. He builds an altar and makes a sacrifice to God. And then it was time to put God's battle plan together. And so he, he went out and he called for men to come. And to, and to follow him into battle. And, and, and I'm amazed, by the way, I'm amazed that 32,000 people actually showed up. And the reason why I'm amazed is because the Bible tells us they were in hiding. They were in the rocks and in the caves. So I'm surprised that 32,000 men actually showed up. And, uh, but, but the problem was, that in fact, in spite of the fact that 32,000 men showed up, that this was nothing compared to the other army that had gathered on the other side. For the Bible tells us that on the Midianite side, 135 men showed up to fight against the 32,000 men on the side of Israel. Now, folks tell me all the time that God is on my side. But I can tell you that I've sat on many board meetings, not, not in this church, <laughs> where folks will tell me, Pastor, 
We can't do that. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. We don't know anybody. We're just a little church over here. And yet we claim God is on our side. But when it's time for action, we crumble and fall. But we must learn to trust in God. To give us the how, even when it, there seems to be no way. Never forget that it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Never forget that nothing is impossible with God. Never forget that if God be for us, who can be against us? Who knows? Maybe one day, maybe God has gathered us together as a church in spite of all the issues we deal with to, to, to use us in a mighty way to bring honor and glory to his name. Maybe God has you here today because he has an amazing mission Amen. for this church to execute. Maybe Maybe he wants to use you like he used Gideon. And so Gideon shows up and he is ready for battle with his 32,000 men. But in John, Judges chapter 7, verse 2, the Bible tells us that God did something that would blow your mind. Uh, now we, we're thinking, here we are thinking that 32,000 is nothing compared to 135,000. They're outnumbered four to one. Plus the fact that Gideon is inexperienced when it comes to battle. And yet, hear what God says in um, Judges 7 2. He says, You still have too many men for me to give you victory over the Midianites, or else Israel might elevate itself over me and say, I saved myself. So tell them, tell the men that if you're afraid, you could go back home. And 22,000 men packed up and went back home. I don't know what that would have done to me. Because there are times in ministry when, when, you, when you plan a program, you put a plan together, an evangelistic series, and, and the members don't show up, and the, the people don't show up, and, and it's discouraging. So I could only imagine how Gideon felt when 22,000 men went back home. I could imagine he began to wonder, what's going on here? Is this the plan that you have put together, Lord? What do I do when folks stop coming to church? What do I do when there's fighting and infighting and issues uh, in the church of God? You begin to wonder. And so I imagine that Gideon begins to wonder uh, because he, 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 I imagine he comes to this conclusion that there's no way that, that 10,000 men are now going to fight against 135,000 men. There's no way we can win this battle. But the last thing God wants are people on his team who are not committed to him. Who are halfway in and halfway out. Who as soon as one little issue pops up, they're ready to become discouraged or afraid or, and walk away. God is looking for the church whose hearts are truly committed to his mission. And so God says... If you're scared, go back. And 22,000 men who obviously were not trusting in God 
went back home because they did not believe in Gideon's leadership. You see, when God called Gideon a mighty man of valor, it was not because Gideon had the skills. We already established that fact. He didn't have the experience. He was called a mighty man of valor because the Lord was with him. For if the Lord is with you, then everything is going to be all right. No matter, there's a sermon I have that says, God can win by many or by few. When Jonathan came up against the Philistines and, and, he, and just he and his armor bearer went up against the entire army of the Philistines and he climbed up the hill and he said, if we get up to the hill, to the top of the hill, uh, that means that God is with us because not only did they have to climb up the hill, but they had to climb up the hill and then be ready to fight. And climbing the hill was enough to tire them out to the point that they would be exhausted. So if we get to the hill, then we know that the Lord is with us. Somebody is going through a fight right now, and it seems as though you can't get to the hill. But if you keep trusting in God, you can get to the top of the hill because the Lord is with you. For it is a God who worketh in us both to will and to do. And I want you to know that it doesn't matter how weak or feeble or old or outnumbered you may feel. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Well... After 22,000 men went back home, God said to Gideon, you still got too many. So when you go to the water pot, 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 um, hole and, and, and those who stop to drink long and take forever, send them back home. This is my imagination here. I could, I could see the men at the hole, right? And they're drinking and they're saying, what do you think about Gideon as a leader? What do you think about this, him sending all those people back home and now we're outnumbered? I, I could hear them beginning to question whether or not they made the right decision to join this church. I mean, to, to get on Gideon's army. And so God said, for all those who are taking forever, send them back. You see, God is looking for men and women who are focused on him. Amen. Who are not distracted by the issues of this world. Who are focused on living the life that God has called us to live. Who are focused on preaching the gospel. Men and women who are of benefit to him that he could use, that he could say like he said of Job. Have you considered my servant? Look at Job. I'm so proud of him. He is living right. He is doing right. He is acting right. I can count on him that even when the devil attacks him, he will not stop trusting in me. Amen. And so the Bible says in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if any man come to me and hates not his mother and father and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life also, he is, cannot be my disciple. Again, he says in Matthew 16, 24, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Amen. And so once Gideon did a second cut, 900 and 9,700 men went back home, leaving only 300 men. But don't worry, because the Bible says those he called, he equips. He equips. Don't worry. 
God has given this church or will give to this church everything it needs for every battle that will come up against it. As long as God is on your side, everything will be fine. God has provided us a Terry and a Terry and a David and a Charlie and a Frank and a Tom and an Anto. He has provided us whatever we need. I'm amazed when I look at this church and see the issues that we come up against that sometimes we don't know how to solve. But at the end of the day, God fixes every problem. Don't be discouraged. We serve a great and mighty God. And so as Gideon got to the battle line, the Bible tells us the spirit of the Lord came upon him. It clothed him. Picture the moment. Picture this amazing, crazy, unbelievable scene. As Gideon and 300 men try to circle 135,000 men. I don't know the distance between. <laughs> and they're trying to, to, to and overpower and destroy and kill this army. And so they circle 300 men, circle 135,000 men. And the only weapons they had was a trumpet and a torch. Because it's not the weapons, you know, it's not the money in the bank, it's not our intelligence, it's not our experience that will defeat the devil. We are no match to the devil, but as long as we have Almighty God on our side, Amen. the Bible tells us that, that they blew the torch and they shouted, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And the Midianites became confused when the light and the trumpet sounded and, and they thought that a great army had come against them and they started fighting each other. For God has promised that he will fight for us. If we will but just have faith in God, God will provide. Yes, God will provide. And sometimes it will come from unlikely places. God will provide the plan that we need to bring us success. God will provide wisdom to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Don't be distracted by how... Big the enemy is, focus on how big your God is. Amen. Don't focus on the weakness of, that we may have in this church. Focus on the strength of the Lord our God. Amen. We might not have enough money. We might not have what it takes. We might not have the people. We might be struggling with all kinds of issues, but we have a great God Amen. on our side. And my God has never fought a battle he has not won. He is still unbeatable. Yes. Amen. He's still unbeatable. And so as you leave this place, as you go to your situations at home, as you face the challenges of life, I want you to know that you have nothing to fear unless you forget the way the Lord has led us in the past. So what are you dealing with? Is it forgiveness that you need? What, is this, what does it say over here? Doubt. Do you need the Holy Spirit? Trust. Some of us need healing. Whatever the need is, we're going to call on God right now. Because as I said, we have come 
with an expectation that God will move in our lives and move in this church. And we will not go back. We will be like Jacob. We will wrestle with God. We will not let you go until you bless us. We have a brother here who has been struggling with issues of sleeping. Our elder. Today we want to lay our hands on him. Pour some oil. And pray that the power of God will be manifested in his life. So that he will be able to sleep like a normal night's sleep. We will claim the promises. There is no power in this oil. There, there is no power in my words. But we will trust in the same God who delivered Gideon and his 300 from the mighty Midianites to heal Brother Hippolyte today. And so we're going to put a chair. I know he's a little... Um, and have him sit. We're going to call the elders to come and surround him and call on the name of the Lord our God to work what may be miraculous to us but is normal to God and bring some healing in his life. And for those of us who have special need, we want to call on the name of God for our need and our situation. <clears throat> Father, the God who heard the cries of the children of Israel when they were exploited, abused, and attacked by the Midianites, the God who heard the cry of your children in Egypt and came and sent a deliverer in the form of Moses, the God who looked down and saw your children suffering in our sins, heading towards eternal destruction and sent your only son, your beloved son, to come and die on Calvary. This God, we believe, still hears and answers prayers. This God, we believe, still has almighty power in his hands. This God, we believe, said to, said to us, Call. Before we call, you will answer. And while we're yet speaking, you will hear. This God that healed in the past is still capable of healing today. And so we lift our brother up before you even right now. You know his situation. You said before we were formed in our mother's womb that you knew us. You assigned this day where he would come and sit here and, and that your oil, which represents the Holy Spirit, will be poured out upon him so that he would have healing that he may be able to sleep and testify for your word says that the rest of a laboring man is sweet and he has labored for you. Grant him the sweet rest, Lord. Even now we pray. And so as we lift him up, we pour this oil, which just represents your Holy Spirit upon him and we claim healing in the name of the Father in the name of the Son and of the Holy Ghost we believe it Lord help our unbelief bless your children who are sitting here some are sick some are discouraged some are lonely some are worried oh God we pray for healing of all your people today we are your children Lord and we need that the word of God would go forth so that men and women would, would know that that this is the house where God dwells. We are your chosen people, royal people, holy nation, separated for a special purpose. Oh God, move among our people, Lord, where there is sin, 
bring for healing, Lord. Where there's brokenness, bring healing. We pray for manifestation of your power in this church, in these times. For we see immorality and we see wickedness taking control. But you are an almighty, all-powerful God. And we call on your name even right now. Touch every person from the littlest child to the most mature adult, Lord. And we pray we would leave this place transformed, Lord. That the fire of God may burn from us to the communities wherever we go. That men and women would know that we are children of God. And that we would experience the power of God, Lord. We claim it in Jesus' name. We claim it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We thank you, Lord, that you still keep your promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.